So um, I'd like to make just a few remarks about um, the pandemic to frame the experience that we're all having. I can wait. Is this okay? I can wait. All right. All right. Okay. Um, because we, we are experiencing a once in a century event. Something very unusual is happening to us as a species. And that is that a, a new pathogen, a new the germ, is having an ecological release. That is to say, this germ has come into us, and it's like, a, like an invasive species. Like if we released rats onto an isolated island, and the rats just overran the island. Our bodies are the island to the virus, which is the rats. And the virus is just going to spread and spread and spread among us until ultimately it becomes what is known as endemic. The virus will never disappear. It will always be a part uh, of our lives as a species on this planet. Partly because the virus has a number of capacities, unlike, for example, a smallpox, which has only human hosts. This virus also can live in animals. So it will just be with us for the rest of uh, our lives. Now, we know quite a bit about this pathogen at this moment. We know, for example, that it is a moderately deadly pathogen. It kills about 1% of the people that it infects. This is an intrinsic property of the pathogen. How deadly is it? And we also know how easily it spreads, which is measured by the famous r naught, the R sub zero, which is how easily does this virus, a virus spread from person to person and uh, that's about three in the original native Wuhan strain. So each case of the virus creates three new cases. And that's how infectious is the virus. You could take those two numbers, which Chinese and Italian scientists released at the beginning of 2020, and many people like me and other epidemiologists were monitoring the situation, and you can plot those two numbers on a graph, for example, the severity, how deadly is the pathogen on the x-axis, and how transmissible is it on the y-axis. And you can plot all the respiratory pandemics for the last 100 years. And up here in the upper right would be the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was the worst pandemic we've had in 100 years. Down here in the lower left with those two numbers would be the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, which we all lived through, but nobody remembers because it wasn't deadly, it just gave you the sniffles. And the 1957 pandemic, which is right here in the middle, which is the second worst pandemic we had, have had. And the coronavirus pandemic is above that, below 1918. So right from the beginning, it was possible to tell that this was going to be a very serious worldwide pandemic. And so it would be, and furthermore, the virus had other properties, like the ability to spread asymptomatically, which was, became apparent early on which caused terrific alarm in many parts of the world. My lab began to follow this uh, pandemic in February of 2020. We uh, had data uh, from China using uh, phone data, mobility of people through China. We were able to track 11 million people moving through Wuhan in, uh, in uh, January of 2020, and uh, were able to show in a paper in Nature that the, uh, that the um, we could predict the intensity and the location uh, and the uh, timing of the pandemic just using human mobility data alone. We also did a bunch of other studies in my laboratory. We looked at the impact of people gathering, gathering like this, or gathering to vote, or gathering to protest, for example, to study how assemblages, how groups of people modified, the, the grouping of people modified the trajectory of the pandemic. My laboratory released an app, a uh, symptom reporting app to track early on. We released this app and a whole host of other things that we have been doing. Now, as you know, we are actually, I would say uh, many people, including many Greek citizens, have the hope that we are, that this is over. But it's not over. I do not think we are at the beginning of the end of this pandemic. But I do think we are at the end of the beginning, the opening phase of the pandemic. We're sort of approaching the end of the opening phase of the pandemic. And even in Greece today, we have 62%, I just heard, vaccination rates. That's a lot of unvaccinated people. I would like to tell everyone that one of, unless you're a hermit that lives up in a mountain, or unless you're very lucky, either you will get vaccinated for this disease, or you will be infected with it. Those are your choices. 
And if you're infected with it, your chances of dying are 1%. Depends on your age. And if you get the vaccine, your chances of dying are one in a million or less. So it's a very easy decision as far as I'm concerned. Either you will be infected or you will be vaccinated. And so the fact that we still have 38% of Greeks who are not vaccinated and the fact that the ICUs in Greece are full in the northern part of the country makes me worried about Greece, just like I'm worried about the United States right now, which is, uh, has similar statistics. Anyway, in the United States, we've had 700,000 dead. Up to a million will die, I think, given the current variants of the virus. You also must understand that this virus continues to mutate, and there could be new variants that emerge that are worse for us in ways I'll return to in just a bit. Greece has had 660,000 cases and 15,000 deaths. And if you look at, if you look at uh, deaths per million, I think the worst country in the world has been Peru, which has had 6,000 deaths per million. Italy and the United States have had about 2,100 deaths per million. Spain, 1,800 deaths per million. And Greece, so far, if my statistics are correct, 1,380 deaths per million. So Greece is doing better than many countries, but not the best that it could do. And I think there are opportunities still uh, for many countries around the world to improve their pandemic response. Worldwide, we've had 4.6 million deaths. And I think one of the further facts that's only slowly gaining attention, the virus doesn't just kill us, it disables us. So perhaps five times as many people as die will have some kind of disability. They will survive the virus, they'll be infected, they'll have long COVID or short COVID, they'll survive, but their bodies will be damaged. They'll have pulmonary fibrosis or renal insufficiency or cardiac problems, or neurologic problems, or psychiatric problems, for example. Those people will require health care. So, and, the, and this will be for years. So the, the impact, the aftershocks of the virus are not just the immediate dead. Once the pandemic is over, we're going to have to attend to all these other individuals. And I think this will reshape healthcare delivery and healthcare systems uh, around the world. Now, one of the things I like to emphasize is that this way we've come to live with coronavirus, the way you're all separated in these seats, we're wearing masks, is a very weird way, especially for but it's but what's important to understand is, is that this way of living, which feels so alien and unnatural is actually neither of those things. Plagues are not new to our species. They're just new to us. We think this is crazy, but our ancestors have been dealing with plagues for thousands of years. Plagues are in the Bible. They're in the Iliad. One of the oldest pieces of literature in the Western canon, Iliada, starts with a plague, right? That's the beginning of the story. They're in Shakespeare. They're in Cervantes. Our ancestors tried to warn us about what it means to live in a time of plague, but we had not experienced that ourselves. And this plague that we are facing is actually much, not anywhere near as bad as the plagues that our ancestors had to face. So what happened and what is happening to us is actually not new to our species. It's just new to us. Furthermore, there's a lot of misunderstanding, in my opinion, about why the economy is suffering. I think it's very important to understand that people think that it is our actions that are collapsing the economy, but it's actually the virus itself that is the problem. So in the United States, there have been estimates that the economic impact of the virus is $16 trillion. Eight trillion dollars, a trillion is a thousand billion, eight trillion dollars of damp economic damage uh, direct economic damage, and $8 trillion of damage due to death and disability and illness. That is a catastrophe, an economic catastrophe, that surpasses the Great Depression. And American citizens still don't see it. I don't think they fully recognize what has happened to them. And I think the situation is probably analogous in Greece. But what's important to understand is, is that this economic impact is, is, is not because of what we're doing. It's because of the virus itself. I'd like to quote from you, uh, you know, this, this, a, an observation that was made 1,500 years ago by John of Ephesus, 
who was a historian and priest and was almost certainly writing in Greek, um, he noted during the plague of Justinian the following thing he said. He said, and in all ways, everything was brought to naught, was destroyed and turned into sorrow, and buying and selling ceased, and the shops with all their worldly riches beyond description, and moneylenders' large shops, he means the banks, closed. The entire city then came to a standstill as if it had perished. Thus, everything ceased and stopped. He's writing 1,500 years ago. There was no government that was closing schools and closing businesses. The economy collapsed just because of the virus. And I think it's very important to understand that distinction. If anything, I think some of the responses our governments have made have reduced the economic and the health impact of um, the virus. Now, plagues are a time of loss. Another thing that you need to understand is the, the emotional response we've had to this epidemic is also very typical. Plagues are a time of loss and grief. People lose their lives. They lose their livelihoods. They lose their way of life. This is what plagues do. And in fact, this causes sadness in the community and, and depression in the community. And this is also something we're going to have to deal with. And in fact, plagues can inflame very dark tendencies. There's always a desire to blame others. During the bubonic plague, there was a rise in anti-Semitism. Jews were blamed. During HIV, there was a rise in blaming homosexuals or Haitians or IV drug users. Uh, during the present time, there's a desire to blame Asians or immigrants. Always, it's a very human tendency to try to blame someone else. But it's not other people that are causing the problem. It's the virus that's causing the problem. And the virus is just like I said earlier, spreading and spreading among us. And also, there are other kinds of dark tendencies that we have. Fear and lies and denial and blame are constant companions to play. In my laboratory, we study um, social networks. We study the mathematical structure of networks and um, the dynamics of how things spread in networks. And one of the things we've been studying is how, how germs spread. So I have friends, and you have friends, and we make these very ornate, interesting, complicated patterns. And the germs spread across those graphs, across that topology, across that architecture of ties. And lies spread right behind it. They're like the roads. The, the social connections we have are the roads. And the virus is driving on these roads. And lies are driving on these roads. And a very big question is, which will win? So the ability to suppress lying during times of plague, to rebut conspiracy theories, to foster the spread of truth and useful information is a crucial public health challenge and has been for thousands of years. Now, I think we're going to have three phases to the pandemic. And I said this at the beginning. It's, it's in the book that uh, I wrote. There's the acute phase, which will last into 2022. That's when we have the biological and epidemiological impact of the virus. As the virus spreads through the human population, frankly, it has to spread throughout the whole world. And then sometime in 2022, we're going to reach uh, herd immunity. We're going to reach this important threshold where pretty much anyone who could have been infected will either have been infected or uh, vaccinated. And then it'll be like a tsunami. You know how a tsunami washes ashore and devastates the countryside. And then the waters recede. And you have to clean up the mess to rebuild all the houses. Or like an earthquake, right? There's the immediate shock of the earthquake. And then afterwards, we have to rebuild, bury the dead, build the houses, and so on. That's going to be the intermediate phase, which I think will last until 2024, approximately. We're going to, it'll take time for our countries to recover, to deal with the psychological, economic, sociological, and clinical aftershocks of the virus. And that, I think, will last until around 2024. And then we will enter the post-pandemic phase. By the way, these are all very typical of other plagues. We will enter the post-pandemic phase, which I think is going to be a kind of a party, actually, a little bit like the Roaring Twenties of the 21st century, like the Roaring Twenties after the 1918 pandemic of 100 years ago. And it's very sensible if you think about it. People will have been cooped up, will have been avoiding social interaction for years. Uh, people are not spending their money right now. Savings rates go up during times of plagues. And people, so people are going to experience this kind of release, I think, 
And um, this also is very typical. And I need to say these are not bright boundaries. These feather into each other, these phases. And we saw a little bit of that this past summer in Greece and elsewhere around the world where people were like, oh, it's over, it's over, let's have fun. It's not over yet, unfortunately. It's like a soccer player kicking a soccer ball and turning his back and thinking, oh, it's, you know, I gotta go, let's go, man. And as he turns around, the ball hits the, the stick and bounces back. I think that is a little bit of what happened this past summer uh, around the world. Now, COVID-19 will have both a biological and a social end. Uh, biologically speaking, essentially, as I said, this virus is gonna become endemic. Uh, it will just circulate among us forever. Generally speaking, viruses tend to, uh, and pathogens, to become more benign. They tend to become less deadly as time goes by. And the reason is that, in the, from a Darwinian point of view, the virus doesn't want to kill us. The virus doesn't want to kill you. What the virus wants to do is have you uh, sicken you and have you walk around and spread to other people. If it kills you, especially if it kills you fast, then it loses the opportunity to spread. And that's not a good thing from the point of view of the virus. So the theory is that, generally speaking, viruses tend to mutate over time to become more benign. But in the short term, the virus can do anything it wants. And the coronavirus, we have now mutants that are more deadly. The alpha variant from the UK from a year ago was about 30% more deadly than the original variant. The delta variant is about 30 to 40% more deadly. And there could be other variants that emerge which are also more deadly, even deadlier. This would be awful and devastating if it were to happen to us. But in general, the virus is likely to mutate to become less deadly. And as I said, we will ultimately reach this threshold of herd immunity. And I think when that happens, what's good, and as I discussed in, in the book, uh, the, the, this virus will become a little bit like chicken pox or Epstein-Barr virus. So when you're exposed to it, you should all, you all probably know this, if you get chicken pox, what's the word for chicken pox in Greek? Anemovloya. Anemovloya. When you get chicken pox as a, as a child, it's, it's bad, but you survive it, and then you're immune for the rest of your life. But if you've never had chicken pox and then get it as an adult, it can be very deadly. So what I think is going to happen with coronavirus, it's going to circulate. It will infect children when they're young. They'll have a mild illness. They'll have some immunity. Then if they're reinfected later on, they fight off the virus. And it'll just periodically reinfect people but not cause much death. That is probably the likely outcome of this virus. But pandemics also are social phenomena, and they have a social end as well. And in this regard, pandemics end when everyone be believes they have ended or what everyone is simply willing to tolerate more risk. One of the things that's very important to understand about pandemics is that there's no life without risk when a deadly disease is circulating. It's not black or white. It's not like the university can protect you or not protect you, or the state can stop the virus or not stop the virus, or you should. it's either safe to fly or it's not safe to fly. There are gradations of risk. And you always have to make this risk-benefit calculus. Is this risk worth taking or not? So it is clear that reopening universities is going to contribute to some cases. That's too bad. Our alternative is to not open the universities, which also is, has consequences, or to uh, open them and tolerate some risk. And so every single public policy decision, unfortunately, requires this kind of risk-benefit uh, calculus. Uh, so, in some sense, the pandemic will end when we all reset our expectations about what level of risk we're willing to tolerate in public life. For example, prior to the pandemic, we tolerated a risk of influenza. We tolerated a risk of motor vehicle accidents, and we went about our lives. We did not all stop driving just because occasionally people died on the highways. And in this sense, I think that in some ways the coronavirus pandemic, which is quite deadly, to be clear, is going to become like our tolerance for the opioid epidemic. I think you also have an opioid problem in this country. We certainly do in the United States. America and Greece tolerate people dying of drug use. We tolerate people dying of motor vehicle accidents. It's a leading killer. We become inured to it. it means we, we, we just don't even think about it or care about it anymore. And in some sense, unfortunately, that's what's likely to happen with coronavirus. Now, I would like to see us get to that point with the fewest deaths possible. 
one of the things that upsets me as a physician and as an epidemiologist is people who say, well, who cares? Then I guess you know, eventually it'll become like that. That's dumb. We can prevent deaths. We can get to that point with many fewer deaths if we were to vaccinate our societies at a high level and behave well, wear masks and do other things for a few more months or up to a year. In some sense, you can think about this as the very, like the very famous Elizabeth Kubler-Ross phases of coping with death. Remember, there's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And that's basically what we've done with the pandemic. Denial initially, President Trump was saying, oh, nothing is happening, nothing is happening. He was lying. Uh, you know, anger, people are very upset about it. Bargaining, oh, well, maybe, maybe if we do this, we don't have to do this worse thing. Depression, which we've seen, and finally, um, acceptance. Um, let me just say a couple things about vaccine boosters, uh, something I call the Swiss cheese model, and then I'll, I'll close. I think I'm on schedule. Am I on schedule? I think so. Look at my watch. You're doing okay. fine. I'm okay. All yeah. right. So uh, we are, I think, probably the first generation of humans alive who have been able to develop effective countermeasures against the vaccine in real time in a way that can modify the course of the epidemic. So in the 14th century, they thought if you took onions and snakes and cut up the snakes into little bits, cut up the onions into little bits and made a paste and rubbed your body with this, that it would prevent the plague. We, and of course it didn't, we however have a tool to prevent the plague, the vaccine, and we invented it in record time. So I think it's very important to understand that this experience that we have is a tremendous opportunity. We're like the first generation of humans to do that. And it is to our advantage to take advantage of this uh, development. And I think booster shots are on the horizon. Now, there's a lot of confusion in how people talk about booster shots. I'm not talking about getting a third dose, for example, of an existing vaccine. I'm talking about the fact that the pharmaceutical companies will begin to develop new versions of the vaccine against new variants of the virus. So I think as time goes by in the future, every three or four years, like you get a tetanus shot or you get an influenza shot, we're going to be getting coronavirus shots uh, into the future. Um, everything I've said depends on that we do not have the very unfortunate emergence of worse variants of the virus. It's possible that this virus could mutate to become much deadlier. Or even worse for us, that this virus might mutate to have strains that evade the vaccine. This would be a catastrophe, if, and it could happen. Uh, I, say, I think that the probability of vaccine evading strains is probably between 1 and 10%. We can have a conversation about how to bound that probability, but I think it's between 1 and 10%. So, so if that happens, we're like back at the beginning. Right? We have lockdowns again. We have to wait for the pharmaceutical companies to develop new uh, variants, new versions of the virus, uh, of the vaccine to vaccinate us, and so on. Now, let me just talk about pandemic response, and then I'll close with one um, other set of remarks. The way I like to think about pandemic response is something known as the Swiss cheese model. The Swiss cheese model, you have to imagine that we have layers of defense against the virus. One layer is we wear masks. Another layer is we have testing. Another layer is we close the schools. Another layer is we have quarantine for infected people. Another layer is we close the borders. Another layer is we ban gatherings. Another layer is we have public sanitation, for instance. Each of those is a layer of defense. And each layer is good, but not perfect. It's like a piece of Swiss cheese with holes in it, OK? A certain number of holes a certain location of the holes in the feta of Swiss cheese, and a certain size of the holes. Now, the vaccine is a very good piece of Swiss cheese with very few and small holes. So if the virus is coming to the piece of Swiss cheese, it'll hit a piece of cheese and bounce back, unless it happens to hit a hole, and then it goes through that layer, penetrates that layer of defense. You should have the intuition that if you took two or three or four pieces of Swiss cheese and stacked them up, none of the holes would align. By the third or fourth piece of Swiss cheese, if you looked at the stack, there'd be no hole that went all the way through. That's the way you need to think about pandemic defense. The vaccines are terrific, but they're not perfect. This is why we wear masks indoors, even though I'm vaccinated, even though probably all of you are vaccinated. 
when I'm inside, unless I'm drinking, I wear a mask as an extra layer of defense. Or if I'm outside, I don't wear a mask. Being outside is another layer of defense. And this is why, despite high vaccination rates, for some time, governments may require or ask people to avoid gathering bans and so on. We, we should not you know, celebrate our victory prematurely. Now, I also want to mention that this, this pandemic could have been so much worse. There's no God-given reason that this virus isn't more spreadable or more deadly. It could have been much more spreadable. The Delta variant has an R0 of 6, for example, which is one of the reasons it's causing them so much trouble. There's a, there's a coronavirus called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which kills 30% of the people that it infects. It just is intrinsically deadlier. That virus is deadlier than this one. So this virus could have been so much worse. It could have killed 10% or 30% of the people that it infected. Just imagine what it would have been like if modern society had been facing this. And unlike bacterial plagues like cholera or bubonic plague, for which we have effective antibiotics, we have very few, if any, effective antiviral agents. So a, 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 a virus that kills 10 or 30% of our people would have caused a like 14th century type occurrence in modern Greece. And this is why public health preparedness is rightly seen as a national security concern. And we could still have such plagues in the future. The interpandemic interval, the interval at which respiratory pandemics are striking us, is every 10 or 20 years we have a respiratory pandemic, and every 50 to 100 years we have a serious one, there's some evidence that that interval is shortening. So we could have another pandemic with a different virus, who knows when, 5, 10, 30, 50 years. If it occurs more than 50 years from now, it'll be, we'll all have forgotten it, but it could occur sometime sooner. So plagues offer new challenges and new opportunities. And I'd like to close with a quote from French philosopher Albert Camus, who in his novel La Peste, about plagues, which is set in Algeria, in the village of Iran in the 1940s, but which is based on experiences from bubonic plague outbreaks in the previous century. So Camus writes this novel and has a protagonist in it, like Dr. Rieu, who's a little bit like this doctor here in some ways. Uh, Dr. Rieu is the protagonist in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the book. And here is what Camus writes. He says, Dr. Rieu resolved to compile this chronicle so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure, and to state quite simply what we learn in time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men and women than to despise. And that's how I see things. I like to think of us in a positive, optimistic, can-do kind of way. We will see the other side of this, but it will require effort. Thank you very much.